Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. But I would like to start my share off by saying that um, Alcoholics Anonymous has saved my life. It's taught me how to live one day at a time and that God has taught me to have faith and to trust and how to relax and how to have peace. And that is um, a miracle for for somebody like myself. Um, Okay, where do I start? I've been praying. I'm hoping my higher power is going to kick in here because uh, I had all these thoughts before the meeting started and then my brain just went completely blank. My name is Sandy and I'm an alcoholic and thanks to Alcoholics Anonymous, I am alive and I have been sober one day at a time continuously for 18 years. And that is a miracle. Um, I am the eldest of three daughters. Um, um, Sorry, I hesitate there because in 2017, my baby sister took her own life to this illness, but I still am the eldest of three. Um, my father was in the Air Force, um, and he was a very, very strict man. Um, I had to, it's like I had um, three, little, three little lives when I was growing up. I had the life at home, which was really, really scary. My dad was unpredictable, and he was uh, quick with his fists, and he was cruel, and um, he said that I would never be loved, um, that nobody would ever want me. Um, the rules were so strict that we weren't allowed downstairs unless he said we could come downstairs. We weren't allowed to speak, laugh or giggle or play in his presence. Um, and um, I learned to try and be exactly what he wanted me to be. You know, I tried to be as quiet as possible. So I basically learned in his presence to, um, or at home, to not to not really exist, if that makes any sense, you know, just to be this really good daughter. Um, My mum has her own issues as well. Um, She, I know now, um, she has the ism because everything that happens around my mum is all about how it affects her. So, like, for example, you know, if I I, um, was in tears about something because I'd fallen off the swing, I wouldn't get the hug and the comfort I'd get that, oh, gosh, I've got so much to do. You know, you were stupid and silly and, you know, go and put a plaster on and go out, you know, get away. Um, And then I I really, really, really loved reading. I'd lose myself for hours in books and go off into fantasy lands. But then I had my school life, which I really, really enjoyed. I loved school. Um, I've heard some people say in the rooms that they never felt like they fitted in but I did feel like I fitted in. I joined, um, I was in the after school clubs. I was in um, the school choir. I was in the netball team. I became a school prefect and then a house head. Um, and I just loved it. Um, and I did well. I did well at school. Um, I landed a good career accidentally. Um, I was working um in a um, large company, just as a set of secretary lady, and I needed some extra money. And a friend of mine said to me, um, oh, I've got a friend that's looking for a cleaner. So I went around to meet this guy, Alex, his name was, um, to see if I could earn some extra pennies cleaning his flat, because he'd worked up in London. And basically, uh, after he'd shown me what he wanted me to do around the house, he said, no, he said, you're too good to be my cleaner. I'd like you to be my PA. I have a newspaper company in Fleet Street in London. Um, And that was it. I was off to Fleet Street. Um, And uh, that that environment was extremely boozy. Uh, um, It was. I was responsible for selling newspaper space. And I had quite a lot of high class um, clients. One in particular in Saatchi and Saatchi. I'd go around there. And we'd take a line of Coke on his desk. Um, I'd get myself the double page spread, full colour. 
And then we'd go out and get absolutely trolleyed. And then I'd get back to the office, you know, at sort of six o'clock at night and go, yeah, I got the deal. I got, you know, and it was sort of a bit like that, you know. Um, but I thought it was all wonderful. And after after work, we'd go to um, oysters, oyster and champagne bars and things. So uh, for many, many years, I, di- I didn't really feel as if I... I didn't feel as if there was anything really wrong with me. I had this core belief within me, deep within me, that I wasn't loved, I, that I wasn't lovable, which made my second, um, apart from partying and drinking and, you know, getting into messes, I, um, I was desperate to find a man. I believed if I could find the right man that loved me in the right way, then I'd be well, I'd be healed. Um, but it didn't work out that way. Every, um, the very first boyfriend I had, a Scottish guy, I mo- he moved me in with him. And then I found out he'd actually got a fiance in Scotland. So that didn't really work out. And then I fell in love with a man and found out later that he was married. Um, and basically all my relationships, um, I, uh, I then, um, because it's important that I say this, because uh, when I eventually ended up in a treatment centre, which is not where I got sober, um, the counsellor there said to me, you've got a second addiction, you've got an addiction to men as well. And then he said to me, oh, could you go and write, um, I'm going to leave you for 15 minutes, could you please write down on a piece of paper what you'd like in a man, what you'd really like in a relationship? He came back 15 minutes later and all I'd managed to write was that he turned up. I didn't have any idea what I, you know, what I wanted. Um, how do I... To all intents and purposes, for many years, my life would look as if it was all right. Um, you know, I, um, because of my upbringing, I was extremely, extremely, and, and still can be, uh, cl- neat, clean and tidy, a neat freak. Um, I'm very organized and I ran my life, you know, in strict schedules. I managed to, uh, but, but all the time there were these things going on in the background. I mean, like, you know, I think I was having a great time um, after work in London and then I'd get to Victoria station and find that I'd missed the last train home and I'd be absolutely trolleyed. One time I remember paying for a taxi all the way back from London to West Sussex. Um, and then, um, one time I ended up in a hotel room with a woman and goodness only knows what we got up to. Um, what I'm trying to say is that I could give you a whole catalogue of events where, where it, I, could, I could brush it off, I could laugh it off. Well, that wasn't so bad, that wasn't so bad. Um, I had no idea that I was an alcoholic. Uh, didn't even enter my head that I was an alcoholic, okay? I'm just going on obliviously, trying to fall in love and trying to have fun and um, living my life by everything outside. If I've got the designer clothes on, I've got the right briefcase, I've got the right coat. If, I've, if, you know, if, if, uh, if I'm listening to the right music, if I'm following the right fashions, whatever, whatever it is, I just thought if I could just get, you know, I just kept doing that. Um, and then I got offered a job um, in a graphic design studio in um, Australia, in Sydney. So I flew over there, went over there to live. And I'd been there about a year. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I mean, you go to a party in Australia and they don't come up with four cans of tenants and a bottle of wine. They come up with slabs. <laughs> I thought I was in seventh heaven. Um, but I'd been there about a year and I was just um, changing jobs. And um, a friend of ours, because I got into a little group of people, um, was going to give me a lift to the new job in the morning. And he said, oh, you ca- I'll take you out the night before. And I thought, oh, great, you know, because whenever I'd gone out with him before or in groups, we'd um, gone out for a bite to eat and then got, you know, got, got very, very, very drunk. You know, so I get into this car with him and um, he... He drives up to this place and then he gets out the car and then he starts talking to this woman and then he, I get out the car and he's basically, he's taking me to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in Sydney. 
And I thought I was going out for dinner and I thought I was going to get, you know, loads of bottles of wine bought for me and have a really nice evening. And I'm suddenly stuck in this little cafe with this woman I don't know that then took me across the road to this um, to this meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I sat at the back and I was absolutely fuming. How dare he as you, my man, I thought, yeah, what, what on earth, you know. Uh, and so anyway, I sat there. And then after the meeting, this woman took me for a coffee. And goodness only knows what she said to me. All I was doing was chomping at the bit going, I just want to get a drink. I've got a brand new job to start tomorrow. This is the last thing I need. I need to be, you know, oh, it was awful. Oh, anyway, um, so that was my first experience of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, uh then I landed in yet another relationship in Australia. I've, I've missed bits out, I'm sorry. Um, when I was in my mid-twenties, I lived with this man and I was engaged to him uh, for three years, but he was extremely violent um, and very, very controlling. You know, he'd beat me up if I didn't clean the kitchen well enough or, or whatever excuses. And eventually over those three years, I went from a very large, voluptuous woman that loved life and was full of confidence to this little stick insect. He dressed me. He dressed me in, in shell suits and made me wear flat shoes. I wasn't allowed nail varnish and I wasn't allowed makeup. And he said to me that I was lucky to have him because nobody else would want me. And to me, that was reaffirming what my father had said. You know, I am unlovable, so I'll put up with all of this because nobody else wants me. Luckily, a friend of mine, after three years, she actually, because I, I talked to her one day, you know, obviously in the pub, crying, and I said, I can't leave. I said, I don't own anything. I'm in his home. Anyway, the next day, she turned up on the doorstep with a brand new duvet, and she get put it in my hand. She says, you own this. You're coming to live with me. And so I, I, I left that one. Um, but then, yeah, then I went, in, I went to Australia. But then I, I, I ended up um, being with another man that was also extremely violent. And he was a cocaine addict um, as well as an alcoholic. But he, and that was, tumult, that, was, that was nasty. That was really nasty. Um, I got to the stage then where I was drinking in the mornings just to manage to get to work and to stop the shakes. Um, yeah, that, that, that was... Because, you see, what it was, was that although he... Although he was, the, he was big, he was six foot two, although he was big, I was just as verbal. We got into these horrendous verbal rows. Um, and I was cleverer than him, verbally. And so he would, you know, he would dump me. And then, but I wouldn't stay down. I'd get up and fight him back. So it it went on, and I oh, it's a bit dramatic, you know. I, I had even my mum calling from England, sending the police round to see if I was still alive. Um, but there was this one night where the beating was so bad, um, and he got me on a counter and was strangling me with the telephone because he used to unplug the telephone when he knew he was going to beat me up, so that I couldn't find a telephone. He was premeditated. I, anyway, so he's got this telephone wire around my neck. And next to me is a kitchen knife on the breadboard. And I just had this flash. I'm going to kill him. Anyway, I don't know quite how I managed to get away from it, but he passed out. And then when he passed out, I just bundled as much as I could into a bag. Bearing in mind, I'm still drunk. This is all, all the time I'm drunk. Um, I was a functioning alcoholic. You know, I would drink in the morning. I'd, um, I'd drink as soon as I got home, drink to blackout, and then go back to work again. So I bundled all my stuff into a suitcase and um, I got a coach to Sydney airport and I don't, it's all a bit of a blur, but I remember being taken up into an office and um, Japanese airlines flew me home for free, but they also kept me safe because apparently he came to the airport looking for me. And so they kept a security guard with me until the flight was due. Um, and of course, I get on this plane and I'm covered in bruises. Like you can't see my eye, my jaw, and all. I was just a right mess. Um, and they sat me on the plane. Now I don't remember what happened next, except I've got a vague memory of when we stopped in Singapore. That I'm—I don't know where I am. The, the whole area is empty. I'm above the, all the people, and there's this uh, foreign gentleman with a buggy sitting on the floor with me. And it was something to do with the fact that I'd got so drunk 
on that first leg of the flight that if I wasn't sober enough, they weren't going to take me for the next leg, leg of the flight. But so he somehow managed to get me back on the plane. So that brings us to 2000. Um, so how old would I have been if I was born in 1965? 35? Yeah, 35. Um, and um, like all, like, like one of the things I've noticed about alcoholics <laughs> and myself is that we're very resilient, aren't we? very very resilient uh, um and i kept thinking if i just pick myself up i could just pick myself up and brush my brush that off and start again and start again and start again um and so i came back from australia and i had a little tiny bed set at seven dials in brighton and i got a job and um i used to have to drink a quarter liter bottle of vodka to even get me to be able to stand up to get into the shower to get me dressed to go to work and it was only 10 minutes down the road, so I'd go to work. I was a PA for two marketing directors, and there was eight telephone salespeople there. And then at lunchtime, I'd come home and drink more vodka. And then I'd get home, and at the top of the road, there was an off-license. And I'd go in there, and I would buy, you know, cans of, uh, of the strongest lager or cider, uh, um, white lightning, and I would just drink till blackout. Uh, one of the things I did, and goodness knows, I used to ring up. There was a radio station that would go through the night. And I used to ring up drunk. Goodness only knows what I said. But I still didn't think I had a problem. And um, I then got told by the boss. I was off sick and my bosses came up to see me. They, they rang me up. They rang me up and said they were coming to see me. And I don't know why, but they, my sister turned up as well, Julia, the little one that sadly not with us anymore. And they basically, they'd figured out that I got paid monthly. And every time after I'd got my payday, I didn't come in for a week after work. And so they knew that, you know, there was, there was something wrong. So basically they said to me, you know, if you can, if you can uh, stop your drinking and, and not have so many sick days off, you know, we'd like to keep you as employed. Um, and then we went to the Christmas party and I got sacked after that because it was in a restaurant in Western Road in Brighton and there was um, loads of booze. But I stayed behind because the, the company had paid for all this alcohol and all the others were going off and going home and being sensible. And I stayed in the restaurant and drank the remainder of the the alcohol that was on the table. And apparently I kept drinking and I had a party and I put everything I drank with all the people I grabbed into my circle on the company bill. And that was like, you know, that was the last straw for them. Still don't have a problem with alcohol. Oh, no. <laughs> I, um, I, um, I, I was lucky, actually. I got offered the job I went back to work for the company that I've been working with before I went to um Australia um this was a and they were in there was a it was in Brighton there was an area in Brighton it wasn't in London and uh I did my best but it was just this routine you know I would I, I would gag in to get to the pub at lunchtime for a vodka anyway what happened next is that, um, again, there was a knock at my door um, and I was in bed drunk and then I opened the door and it was my boss and a work colleague were with her. And they said, oh, my God, we've been so worried about you. You haven't been to work. And I was like, well, isn't it Sunday? And they were like, no, Sandy, it's Wednesday. And I was like, oh, my God, you know. So... They called me in and they said, if you can, if you can, we know that you're an alcoholic, but if you can stay sober and you can get help, we'll keep, we'll do our best to keep you on. Well, that was it. I'm not going to, I wasn't, I, I wasn't ready to stay sober. So I was just like, no, thank you. Um, and then of course it spiraled. Um, I met before, before I lost that flat. Um, I would have all sorts of people in. I, I had uh, uh, people that were into heroin and they would come in and, the, and I'd wake up and my flat would be trashed and things would be stolen. 
Um, and I, I, it was just carnage. There was no normal normality to it whatsoever. And then they faded away. And then there's just me. And then um, there was violence and police officers. And um, uh, it's a bit difficult to remember. And and then I I lost my home. And then I was on the streets. And I can't really remember details about that but to survive on the streets I slept with whoever would sleep with me I stole I told lies I used I mean I used to tell lies to the public about you know I needed a train to so and so so that I could get I, I could get something or an alcohol and in the end even though even in that really drunk state something whispered to me they're not going to believe those lies anymore so I then would lie and say, look, please, 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 can you give me 20 quid? Because I've been offered a place in a rehab centre up north. If I could just get to them, they'll give me a place. And they were, and people were like, oh, God, yes, you definitely need to go to rehab. Here, here's 20 quid. I'd just go and spend it. And I don't really quite know how or, or what happened. My mum intervened. Um, and I ended up uh, being sectioned. Um, it's all a blur. I, I I got sectioned, and then I came out, and then I was arrested. Then I got sectioned. Then I came out, and then I was in a rehab center, a treatment center in Brighton, which wasn't really twelve step. It was um, suggested as a twelve step program. And um, when I went in, I had no idea. I spent six months in that treatment centre, three months in the first section and three months in the next, and I just really enjoyed myself. <laughs> I made friends, I laughed, I gained weight, I went to group, I did writing, I, uh, I did therapy work, um, and I went to one AA meeting, and then I realised that if I didn't go to an AA meeting, I had the whole house to myself in the evening, which was brilliant because um, my teenage bulimia had come back. So I would then spend the evenings while my work, my, my mates were uh, at a 12 step programme, eating and throwing up and eating and throwing up and eating and throwing up until they came home. And then I'd make sure I was sitting in front of the TV so that everything looked normal. You know, I left there. And I was fortunate enough to, have to rent a home that took housing benefit. And I got my disability living allowance, which is a benefit if you can't work. And I thought, well, if it's just not about drinking, I can do this. I can do it. I don't need AA. I can do this. Well, I didn't know anybody. And um, I came out of the treatment center in the November. And... Um, and my mum said to me, we don't want you with us at Christmas because, you know, you'll spoil our Christmas. And that really, really hurt. But I hung in, I hung in there. Um, and, um, but my life had became, I was so scared to leave the flat that when I did go, um, it'd be like I would be hugging, hugging the wall and looking down. And I, like a rat, little rat running along the street, doing a shopping and coming back. And, and um, needless to say, um, I didn't last very long. I lasted until I think it was the October. So 10 months, completely alone, going completely insane, really paranoid, frightened of everything. I thought if I opened the front door, everybody was um, staring at me. And I was just, I just lost my mind completely. And so I picked up. Um, and it started off with a very small glass of red wine, one of those little ones, and a packet of my favourite crisps. And I was watching this reality TV series where every, every evening at 6.30, um, this group of hairdressers would come on the TV and you just get to know them. And they became my friends. They were the, they were, they were the only friends I had in my life. And so... Um, I remember crying when the series ended because I didn't have anybody to, to be with. But at what, because I picked up the carnage, it, it, it all came back. Um, uh, um, yeah. 
I got um, arrested again. Um, I got beaten up again. I got my flat trashed again. My parent, my mum, sorry, parents, my mum said, look, we can't. With my, I, I vaguely remember my mum standing at the end of the bed saying, um, I can't watch you die. Because by this stage, I was um, about just over five stone. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't swallow anything. I was passing blood and I was absolutely on the edge. Um, and she said, I can't, st- I can't stay and watch you die. And I remember her walking out. And then I remember my cat going out the window because I'd forgotten to shut it and getting run over. And I remember going out and finding her dead and rock hard and sitting with her in my lap, crying my eyes out. Um, and drinking vodka Um, and by then I'd been given my next eviction notice because I didn't want me living there and um, it was the 15th of February 2004 and I was in this flat due to being made homeless again I had absolutely no one in my life my cat had been run over I'd been sectioned and arrested and I self-harmed horrendously I put an iron on my stomach. I sliced over, open my stomach to try and cut out the the demon and the evil that was in there. I've got cigarette burns all over my arms. I shaved my head, but for a different reason <laughs> than today. Um, and I, I suddenly got this. What do we call it in AA? Moment of clarification. I knew I was dying. I knew that there was no more cunning ideas. There was no more Sandy picking herself up. There was no more brushing yourself down and going, oh, that wasn't so bad. I can, I can, you know, I can get over this humiliation or this, this rejection or this abandonment. I can start again. There wasn't anything left. I hadn't anything left. And I felt I was going to die. And I remember just curling up on this bed and crying out I just cried out for something I said I don't want to die I don't want to die and I I've had some people in you know say to me since that this was just my survival instinct but I don't think it was because I heard a voice that said to me you are not alone you have never been alone and every minute that goes by you will get better and it was like a mantra just going on and on and on and um, the vodka bottle was beside my bed. It still had half of it left in there. Um, and I called Alcoholics Anonymous in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning or something. And I got this wonderful guy called John who spoke to me on the phone almost right through to daylight. I mean, he, I would... I would be throwing up, I'd be, you know, talking rubbish, but he kept coming, he, he would ring me back and he rang me back and he rang me back. And um, then uh, there was a knock on my door sometime the next day and there was this tall man and this woman standing there going, we're going to take you to AA. And I was like, oh. you know, oh, <laughs> who are you? <laughs> anyway, they did. They took me to my first, what I call my first AA meeting. And it was at St Andrew's in Brighton and um, big book study group meeting. And um, I totally disrupted the meeting by having an alcoholic fit and they had to call an ambulance. Apparently I was screaming on the floor like I was being surrounded by, you know, something from the devil. I was, but anyway, I haven't had a drink since that day. And that is because Alcoholics Anonymous came to my rescue before then, you know, I had tried self-help books. I tried medication. I tried men, obviously. I tried shopping. Um, But I remember, you know, in those last few years, going to GP surgeries and crying my eyes out and seeing psychiatrists and seeing counsellors. And I can't, you know, explaining all of this that I felt, all of this that I think, you know, I used to say to them, you know, you don't understand what it's like to be like me. I said, it feels like I've got ants in my veins. I've got an elephant on my chest. I can't breathe. There's, you know, there's bees living inside me. It's just crazy being me. There's too much noise being me. I, 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 can't, I can't cope with this. You've got to help me, got to help me. You know, and they never could. And they never could. 
And uh, so this very, very skinny, very, very uh, messed up woman crawled into AA 18 years ago and just kept coming back. Now, I don't, it's hard to look back on reflection, you know, um, but somebody gave me the big book and said, read it. And some, and whoever it was that gave it to me said to me, start with the stories in the back because, you, you know, you're new, you don't really understand what it's all about and all the rest of it, just start with the stories on the back. And I turned to the story in the book that's called My Chance to Live, which is why I wanted the banner that it's our chance to live. Because I remember I was still really poorly. I still wasn't sleeping. I was chain smoking and drinking hundreds of cups of tea. And I'm in bed reading this story. And it was like, oh, my God. This woman, she feels inside like I feel inside. She describes herself as being battered and bleeding and bruised. And, and it just went on and on. And, and, and the tears were just streaming down my face. And I thought, oh, my God, there's somebody out there that feels like I do. And um, ooh, I, I, I don't need to say it to you guys, do I? Really, you know, you know what it's like. So to suddenly find that I'm amongst a group of people and welcome, I want you know, welcome in any state to uh, to, to, to 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 come along and see if this. 12 step program of Alcoholics Anonymous can stop me drinking. Well, it did. But I, as the weeks went by and I saw the, you know, I heard how it works and I saw the think, think, think on the floor and uh, easy does it one day at a time. And I heard all these sayings uh, about everything. It was like they were slowly, slowly starting to make sense to me because I was still terrified as a person, even going to AA, I'm not saying, you know, oh, I found AA and then life was amazing. No, it wasn't. I was raw. I was, there was nothing dull in my thoughts. There was nothing sheltering me from the world. And it was horrible. You know, if the telephone rang up, my body felt like shattered glass. It just, oh my God, this is the phone. You know, and if somebody knocked at the door, I wouldn't want to answer the door. I had to get members of AA to take me shopping because I, I just couldn't cope with, I was overwhelmed. I hadn't gone shopping for years. All I used to buy was a pot noodle and bottles of vodka. I couldn't stand in front of baked beans and tomatoes and, and bread and all the rest of it and looking at the pennies in my hand and going, oh my God, how do I shop? I don't know how to shop. Um, so... I had help but with AA for, for all of this. So, but, but yes, so obviously as a newbie, I haven't got a clue that what I think is... It, it was so warped. But when, you know, when it's sort of the penny started to drop and I saw step two, came to believe that a power greater than me could restore me to sanity... I was like, oh, right, because I'd spent my whole life believing I was, I was, I was loopy. At the end of my, my alcoholic career sort of confirmed that I was loopy because I thought I was Captain Jack Sparrow, you know, so I have to be a bit loopy. And um, when I look back, I, you know, after my third year of sobriety, when I look back and people say, oh, gosh, you've done three years, how have you done that? And I said, I don't know. Have you done 18 years? I don't really know. I've just done what's been suggested. But it recovery is like, like shifting sand. It just gently sort of comes into you. But so what was I trying to say? Yes, the, the fact that um, I was, I said, so I became aware. I've got a note here. Here we go. I, be, I began to, re, to realise that how I reacted to life and how I um reacted to people around me and what my thought processes were. I began to see, my because I was always drunk all the time, I didn't give a monkey how my response was. You know, if somebody, like, for example, I used to get really upset, I've said it before in a meeting because it just makes me laugh now, that if I was, when I took over service and was doing tea duty, if somebody put the teaspoon just on the counter and not in the saucer that I'd asked, I'd wanted them to put the teaspoon, I'd get really, really upset. I was judging everybody and everybody's behavior um 
but I didn't know all of that. Anyway, when I began to realise that uh, there was something seriously wrong with me, I remember being very, very upset because I, Janesta's heard this before and Carl's heard this before and firm, but it was like my head was like, I imagined my brain to be like a massive mountain that was covered in snow and that every year as the snow melted, the water would run down these ravines on this mountain and every year that went by, they'd get deeper and deeper and deeper. And these were my thought processes. They were, they were just natural. How on earth am I going to change my thought processes and change how I think? But by doing the steps and listening and being willing, um, oh, it's so... Uh, it's funny, isn't it? Because, you see, I, I read somewhere, uh, and it's in the literature somewhere, I think it's in the Daily Reflections, it says uh, that I can create my own reality. But before that, we hear a hundred times in AA, you've just got to accept life as it is, life on life terms. That's what it is, it's acceptance. Well, I get that, I'll accept life on life's terms, but it isn't very easy accepting life on life's terms when I'm, a, when I'm going at it from my illness. And I don't know how to express it. It's so, oh, I need Janesta now. Um, like, oh, let me try and give you an example. Say I overslept, okay? My alarm clock didn't go off. Um, and then uh, the bus was late. Uh, and then it took a detour. And then I was going to be late for work. And then whatever. Now, for me, I could wake up initially and be full of rage and go, oh, for fuck's sake, the alarm clock bloody didn't go off, useless piece of shit, and chuck it on the floor, not thinking, oh, don't think you plugged that in last night, Sandy. Oh, that's a bit, you know. Um, and then I would be in a panic, and then my head would be going right forward um, with my conversation that I'm going to be having with my boss when I turn up late, and I'll be going in there going, well, don't ever go at me for being late. You don't know the number of times I've stayed behind late and you've never paid me for that. And what about the times I haven't had my lunch break and you've taken advantage of that? So don't give me a hard time just because I'm 10 minutes late, you know. And then in my head, I'll be like, well, he can stick his bloody job anyway. I don't like it that much anyway. So whatever. And my head would have been going like that. So that would be my reality. And that's not a nice way to live. That's a horrible way to live. It's full of fear. And when I'm frightened, I get angry. But if you really get to know me and push my buttons, when I get frightened, I cry. <laughs> so those are the two things. But but now, you see, AA's taught me that if my mobile, if my alarm didn't go off, I'd just calmly go to plug it in, ring my boss and say, oh, I'm so sorry, my alarm hasn't gone off. I'm going to be late. And he'd go, no worries, sweetheart. I can pick you up if you like. <laughs> you know? And then life is life's acceptable because it's on life's terms. So it's it's how I respond to it. I mean, like for example, if I uh, I remember doing a dinner party in recovery because I thought that when you're in your thirties, well, I was actually in my forties, I didn't know how to live. I'd learned everything by TV. I'd learned how to be, I'd learned, I'd learned how to live an alcoholic life through through media and social media and how to dress and how to have sex and what to look like and all the rest of it. So I thought, oh, this I'll, I'll get my um, how to live sober from the media. And all these 30-something people were having dinner parties, don't they? They all have these tables. And I thought, oh, I'm going to do that. So I ordered all the food and I invited them. I had enough t tables for t seats for 10 of us in my little flat and um, invited them all round. And one by one by one by one, they cancelled one by one, and then one person turned up. It was my best mate, Sarah, actually turned up. Now, initially, because it makes me smile, because when I was 15, I had a um, uh, an Avon party, and I wanted people to come around to my house after school and have an Avon party, um, and mum got out the biscuits and made some sandwiches, and nobody turned up, and I burst into tears, going upstairs, and I didn't want to go to school the next day because nobody liked me proved it they wouldn't come to my party so they didn't like me but when this happened in AA and I got this table laid and everything all out and everything and none of them turned up I turned to Sarah and we went yeah get in <sighs> it's just the two of us look at all the food we've got <laughs> you know they'll keep going for a week or two so I know it all sounds silly and I know it all sounds trivial but life for me life is just bits and pieces 
It's the bill coming through that you're not expecting. It's the phone call that doesn't come when you think it is. It's trying to get a doctor. Oh, I'm sorry about that. He thinks he's a gymnast and he hangs off this thing. Um, but yeah, life is, um, is all these little things. Try not being able to get a doctor's appointment um, when you want one. Um, and people letting you down. And um, But Alcoholics Anonymous, through doing the steps and staying close to the meetings, excuse me, has shown me and taught me that there's a really easy way to deal with all of this. Now, I lost my... There was one... In 2017, I was... How long have I got? Because Seven minutes. Um, in 2017, my baby sister killed herself in the January to this illness, and my half-brother took his own life in the March. And then in the April, my landlord sold his home, my home, and I was, in effect, homeless again. Um, but because I was already quite a few years sober, I was already tooled up, so to speak, for all of that. And because the God of my understanding, when I first came in, I didn't think I've, I'd got religious God. Uh, I'd been to church and didn't like what I heard, and I thought, well, you know, He's terrifying. I don't want to, don't like that. But so I, I had angels to start with. Angels, I communicated with angels because I believed that I wasn't worthy or brave enough to talk to the big man in the sky, but little angels could be my guide. Um, and I, they did. They, they, gave, they did. They, you know, they still do today. I can be going out, bang my head on something. And what I've banged my head on is a book that I'm meant to be taking out with me because I promised to lend it to a friend. And if I hadn't banged my head on that thing, I'd have left the book behind. That's my idea of angels working. But um, I don't, I can't logically explain my higher power. All I know is that there is one, there was that moment when I heard the voice and I haven't had to have a drink since then. So that is a miracle in itself. But the other, the way I've grown with my, with my connection to my higher power is because I live alone, um, no kids, no husband. Um, it's like I've got this constant companion. And the moment I open my eyes, I know that if I'm not careful, I'll have the ism on me and when I say the ism it's like I've got I'm lying there in the morning and I can feel two energies waking up and one energy is God and all the nice stuff and the other one is all of the ism which is oh god it's raining outside oh god I get it I get it up oh god so and so didn't phone me back yesterday well sod her I'm not going to speak to her ever again that one is wanting to go forward but all I have to do is I lie there and I go oh Morning, God. I'm alive. <laughs> I'm alive. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, could you please show me, you know, can you help me through the day? And Janesta said something and, and it resonates with me. And I've even got it written up uh, in, my, uh, in, my, in my kitchen. And, it's, and it is this, and it is so true. God either is or isn't. So in the past, my God was there when I was in problems and I'd cry out and go, oh, God, can you help me with this? And I'll promise I'll be good. The, the, the relationship that, I've, that, I, that I feel I have with my higher power at the moment, because it does shift and change and grow as I stay longer in the, in the program, is that the God of my understanding cares about everything in my life, not just whether I have a home I like or whether I do a good chair, or whether I... It cares about all of it. You know, how my body's feeling, how my environment is. It's like, for the first time in my life, I guess, and after, after the childhood I had, and then the romantic relationships that I didn't have, for the first time in my life, I'm slowly, slowly beginning to feel that I am loved. And it's a better kind of love than the one I used to search for that was in the sheets in the bedroom. Um, I just want to say this. What, you know, when I say how's it worked for me, what I've done is the reason I, I feel so good today and I'm sober and I have 18 years is that I stay close. I stay close to the fellowship because I belong here. 
and I stay humble because my ego and my pride are one of my worst defects. They were the ones that will, will generate the resentments. They're the ones that will tell me unpleasant things about myself and about you guys. So I stay humble and I stay as honest as I can. And when I, when I first heard honest, I thought it meant I'd, I'd stop nicking things from shops. No, I need to be honest with me. What am I feeling? What am I, why am I doing what I'm doing? What's my motive behind this? And the more honest I have got with myself, the happier I, I am. It was, it's weird. It's like this. Do I really want to look inside myself and see what, what's in there? And Oh, my God, I do. Because I'm human. But I don't have to react on all that's in there. Um, so, yeah, I stay close, stay humble, stay honest. And I share, share, share. And I let go and let God. <laughs> And I'm as nutty as a box of frogs. <laughs> and I don't know whether I said anything to help any of you guys, but it honestly works. One day at a time, just don't, put the, just don't pick the drink up and everything else will sort itself out. And I think that's me done. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.